Micah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks and you shall not work haughtily for it will be a time of disaster. In that day, they shall take up a taunt against you and moan bitterly and say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To an apostate, he allots our fields. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of our Lord. Do not preach, thus thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us, should this be said, O house of Jacob. Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? But lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children you take away my splendor forever. Arise and go, for this is no place to rest. Because of uncleanliness, that destroys with a grievous destruction. If a man should go about in utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, how would be the preacher for this people? Or he would be the preacher for this people. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. May God bless the reading of his word, for this is the word of God. You may be seated. We are in this short little series through the Old Testament book of Micah, an Old Testament prophet, a minor prophet just by the size of the book. We've talked about this for the previous two weeks, and there's a lot more in Micah than can really be dealt with in a sermon, so a Bible study and a private study, a personal study. In fact, what we're hoping to do for our D groups, what I've discovered is those, there are a number of you doing D groups even now, and then there are many of you that aren't quite sure what a D group is, and then I've heard many of many people in our church tell other people what a D group is, and most of them get it wrong. So we're going to have to kind of guide through what a D group actually is. It, uh, here, here's just a little quick, quick uh, understanding of it. It is a one-year commitment of a group of men or a group of women, same gender, seeking to gather together for a full year with men, only five or six, women five or six in a group. You say, well, can you have seven? It's not a legalistic rule. I'm just telling you, five or six is probably enough. Twelve is too many. Once you get 12, one's going to betray you. Jesus proved that. So I'm just going to tell you. Five, six, seven, that's probably enough. And that group meets every week for a year. And you say, well, what curriculum do we use? We call it the Bible. We're not buying anything else from Lifeway or right now or anyone else for you to lead through this. It's the Word of God. And it's a time of, it's a closed group. That's a really weird concept for many Southern Baptists because Sunday school is an an open group, meaning anybody can come in and go as they please. But a a, a D group is saying, hey, I'm going to commit to you for a full year meaning you and me and our friends, our brothers and sisters and our church family in this small little group is closed, meaning no one else gets to join it for a full year. Well, that doesn't seem fair. It, it's the rules. I did make that one up. So, because once you bring people into a group, the dynamic of the group changes every time. There is a place for Sunday school and open groups. There is a place for the small groups that are closed, and it's only for a year. And you're like, I don't know if I like that. Well, I, It's not up for a vote. It's just a discipling process. And many of you are already doing it. And by your own testimonies back, you have found it fruitful. Because within those groups, you get to know one another. You can't get to know hardly anybody in a building set up like this. You could have somebody sitting behind you or in front of you miss worship for the next five weeks before you know where they are. In fact, I would dare say that right now, you likely don't know everybody's name in your section. You probably don't know everybody's name in the pew before you, behind you, or two or three before you or behind you. It's just the nature of rows. So the D group comes together in such a way. What we're going to be doing in in August is, in, in just a couple of weeks, is give you an opportunity for a place to meet in your D group. Now, why am I bringing up D groups now? Because I think D groups are the secret sauce for what this church needs to grow as disciple makers. I think it's replicated. I think it's uncomfortable. 
And I think that's what we need. So I'm challenging you to get into a D group. And you go, well, Pastor, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody either, just so you know. I don't know who you would like to sit with for a year. I have no idea. I could tell you people I don't want to sit with for a year. <laughs> but finding people that I would do a group with for a full year, that might be more challenging. So it's going to force us out of the comfort zones that we find ourselves in at times. And maybe you can't do a D group this year, but maybe next year. And by the way, doing a D group doesn't get, mean that you just quit going to Sunday school. There's a place for that as well. So let's get into this because I think the D group is where you get into this even more deeply because here's what we will be doing in the future. Every time there's a sermon preached on Sunday, there'll be a talk sheet on Monday available on our website. I'm getting a lot of tinny feedback on this audio, so I'm not quite sure if I've turned into Mr. Roboto or if there's something going on. Some of you don't know who Mr. Roboto is. <laughs> Dorio Magato. Okay, here we go. Um, but uh, I never knew I'd quote sticks in a sermon. So um, <laughs> what we're going to provide for you are talking points based on the sermon preached the day before. So that when you do meet, if you're saying, what are we going to talk about? We're going to look at the Word of God. We're going to look at the book of Micah. We're going to go a little deeper into it for the next seven weeks because that's about how long we'll be in this. So we will provide resources. But we're also going to uh, believe you have it within you and the Holy Spirit within you to go through those groups well. So as we look at this, this is a lot in Micah chapter 2. But ultimately it comes down to rebellion. Now rebellion is always directed at authority figures. I guess that's the definition of rebellion. You don't really rebel against someone that's not an authority over you. And rebellion to what? To rules, to guidelines, to signs? You know, you'll see signs put up and signs are often placed in places to ensure that people behave because we want everybody else to behave. At least I do. And sometimes those signs are there not just to keep people, to make them behave, but to, to keep people safe. They're good. You'll see signs in neighborhoods that say children at play. And when you see children at play, I mean, if you're a nice person, you know that is not mean drive faster right? I saw one sign that said, drive as if your children lived here. And I had a person tell me, does that mean I drive fast to get away? I don't know what that means, but <laughs> it's not nice. But when you see a sign that says children at play, what it's to do is to warn you that there might be some children that might be running out into the road accidentally on their skateboard or a ball might go out there. And you need to be aware. You need to look around. There are signs that are there for their protection and for yours. And if you rebel against that, then really something tragic could happen. And then there are signs that just really beg for you to rebel against them, like keep off the grass. Don't you want to just kind of stand on that? Um, when I was uh, leading a BCM group at UNF a number of years ago, in the room that they had rented at the university was a trash can, and uh, somebody with a label maker put a label on the trash can. And the label on the trash can said, this trash can is not to be used to prop open doors. I have never wanted to prop open a door in my life as much as I wanted to with that trash can. <laughs> uh, they probably had cameras on me. It's probably the only one that was not allowed to be used in such a way, but I'm, I didn't even want to prop a door open until I got there. And then you tell me that, and I'm like, wow, that's our nature, right? Here in Orange Park, I drove by, I think on Plainfield one day, I saw a sign in the front yard. It was a big sign that said, it is a state law that if your dog messes in a yard, you've got to clean it up. Now, that's not a random sign for no reason. Somebody's upset at their neighbor's dog for the gift they keep leaving them. But now everybody on the road knows the state law, apparently, about dog gifting. So, we live in a culture that has signs and rules, and that's not bad. But we also are a people that rebel by nature. In fact, we are a a nation built on a rebellion of sorts. If you want to go back to the revolution, I'm saying it's still a good thing, but nonetheless, that's kind of how we launched here. And rebellion is in our hearts. But when our rebellion is against God, which it is by nature, even the most godly of us will rebel against him and his laws, we face the consequences. There are three phases within a culture, and we see this in cultures throughout the world. And throughout history, three phases just about every culture will go through in regards to rebellion. And these three phases are indicative of what has led, or at least descriptive, of what has led to moral collapse in many empires throughout history. And you can kind of trace this back. I mean, there, 
The Roman Empire no longer exists. The British Empire isn't what it is now. The, you say, we're not an American empire, but we are certainly American influential and a world power. And so you're starting to see some shifts even there. And it was theologian Theo Hobson, a British theologian, who I think stated it as clearly as I've ever heard. He said, in these three phases, here's what happens. One, what was condemned must now be celebrated, meaning this, that something in the past that was condemned as immoral and wrong and sinful and not allowable, when moral shift begins to take place in a culture, those things that used to be condemned must now be celebrated in order for you to kind of survive the culture. If you have, if, if, if you just looked around, you notice that's a reality. You might blame it on an older generation going, well, back in my day. Well, it's not a back in my day moment. It's a symbol of moral collapse through a moral revolution. That which used to be condemned must now be celebrated. You know, like with a special month or with flags or whatever you want to give it. That's phase one. Phase two is what used to be celebrated must now be condemned. What used to be, I, I listen to old radio westerns when I'm mowing my lawn. I don't know why, but I do, because, you know, it, it, you know once Roy starts singing, I mow faster. I don't know, but uh, I do. It's old gun smokes and this. So I was, Tales of the Texas Rangers, right? So I'm thinking, oh, okay, Tales of the Texas Rangers. And uh, Walker wasn't in it, so I was a bit disappointed. But it was, I think it was from the late 50s. And at the end of Tales of the Texas Rangers, whoever the, the, the star, and some of you know, and you're going to tell me, and it won't matter. It's just some old radio show. So he comes up, and now, you know, sponsored by Corn Puffs. And now I'm going to tell you, we've had a lot of letters come in, Tales of the Texas Rangers. You've asked about the Texas Ranger prayer. And I'm like, I didn't know there was a Texas Ranger prayer. But apparently there's a Texas Ranger prayer. And it's authentic. We're going to read it to you today in closing. And so they close the radio program brought to you by the National Broadcasting Corporation, the Texas Ranger Prayer. And in Jesus' name, amen. I'm like, what? I mean, they don't end like Chicago PD with a police prayer nowadays. Or, you know, it just doesn't, it's a different thing. And you'd look at that and go, oh, that's crazy. It's just what used to be condemned must now be celebrated. What used to be celebrated must now be condemned. And the third one is the most challenging one, the one we're seeing most evident today. That those who refuse to join the new celebration of that which should be condemned, they must now be condemned. You might hear it as cancel culture. Nothing new under the sun. Solomon wrote that. What's happening in our culture today is not new. It's just maybe new to us. It's happened for centuries across the world. What used to be condemned must now be celebrated. What used to be celebrated must now be condemned. And those who refuse to join the new celebration, well, those people must be condemned or canceled. Micah was sent by God to a people who had lived in a culture not unlike ours in many ways. They had slid down a slope of religiosity without love to the point that their walk with God was not only hindered, but totally absent. They were religious with all the trappings of religiosity. But that's about it. They were not walking with God as holy individuals who had been rescued by God in their ancestral stories. And one, they had just put God, kind of like God became a, I don't know, a spiritual rabbit's foot that they'd carry around when they needed needed good luck. God's people had made a shift from condemning sin to celebrating sin, and they finally had made a shift from not only celebrating sin, at least in their own lives, justifying sin. Now, not much is different today as many Christians look at the historical oppression of Christianity throughout the years, and we look at, at what we're facing now, both, both what we see now as people seeing Christianity as historical oppression, I don't know if you've seen that kind of in the trend, or, or at best a mythological self-help, self-care. So that's not how we see Christianity. We think it's very real and very personal, but if you're on the outside looking in, it just looks like a weird political group that is hoping for, for some mythological thing to hold on to. And all of that is far from biblical truth as we now see Hobson's phases of cultural decline lived out not just in our culture and in our time frame and in our world, but within even some denominations who are trying to figure out how, how big the split's going to be in their own denominational structure as evangelicals start taking sides and moving out. 
Thus the warnings of the long dead prophet ring true today and therefore, why do you do a sermon series out of the Old Testament book of Micah? Because the word of God is living and active and this word is not to be ignored. And while the context is a bit different, the truth remains the same. Rebellion leads to what we call replacement theology. Even within the hearts and minds of those who would not consider themselves to be rebellious to God, we tend to find ourselves going down that slippery slope. It it leads good citizens, perhaps. It leads to creating a culture of good citizenship, but poor disciple-making. See, you can be a good citizen and a good person and a good neighbor and a good member of your HOA and a good member of your local club and a good member of your society and not be a disciple-maker. And if we're not disciple-makers, then somehow We've missed what God has called us to be because the Great Commission does not say, go ye therefore and be a good neighbor. Go ye therefore and make disciples. Well, I don't know if I've ever made a disciple. Well, then you've sinned. I mean, I don't know how else to put If you're not making disciples, have made a disciple, or are working to make a disciple, somewhere you have ignored that section of the Great Commission. It is on us. It's not for just professional Christians who get paid to do good. It's for all of us to make disciples. And when we fall into replacement theology, we will end up with groups or churches that are full of good citizens but not disciple makers. And in local communities, sometimes it results in, in, in especially in this age, it's another election year. It's always an election year. Have you ever thought maybe we're, we're, oh, we're done with that? No, here it comes again. We're voting again. So what you end up with is maybe a culture that is maybe politically declared conservative, if you want to go that route, but they've married political conservatism to liberal morality. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. What do you mean? That means they may vote the right way, but they sleep with the wrong people. Man, I didn't think I'd get an amen because you know it's true. Morality gets ignored, and it's justified. Wow, you know. It leads to replacement theology, which replaces biblical love, which is agape love, a love for God that is centered on the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love for others, which comes out of Leviticus with simple responsibility or duty. Let me just say, church, if, if your Christianity is nothing but duty and obligation, without the passion and the love for God and others, then we might need to just stop now and have a a service of repentance. And may I confess that I fall into duty and obligation more often than I wish. I'm not up here going, I got it figured out. Just be like me. I mean, Paul said that, I'm not quite there. Some of you are here because it's Sunday and it's your obligation. And let me just say thank you because I think it is an obligation. But if it's only an obligation without the passion and the love that we must have for our Father, then we find ourselves in the routine that ends up in a rut. And what's the old saying? The difference in a rut and a grave is a grave has sides and the rut just keeps going on and on. We can't live there. Duty is the result of a philosophy or a theology of ought to with no passion or love of God. When left to our own devices, selfishness of the heart allows that we should be motivated by love to be replaced with motivated by responsibility. Why do you do what you do for the Lord? Because you love him so deeply you can't fathom doing anything but? Or because somebody, a pastor, a teacher, a missionary, a grandparent, a parent, a coach, or someone else has told you that if you love him, you will do certain things. Now, I'm not discounting that, as James had said, our works will follow our faith, that if we love him, we will do certain things. But I think somewhere along the line, maybe we've just missed that you are created as an image bearer of God, a human being, and you are, but somehow we've transitioned that into, well, you're just a human doing, and God only likes you when you do stuff. It's easy to fall into that trap. Why do you do what you do? Being obligated to do things because it's the right thing is not wrong, totally. But over time, obligation and responsibility can overwhelm love and love becomes faded 
but the duty remains. Suddenly, your motivation for serving the Lord is no longer love, but obligation. Think about a marriage built on love that loses the love, but the people stay together because they're obligated. Now it kind of clicks, doesn't it? Huh. It's a different household at that point. Now, there is an obligation, and there is a duty, but apart from love, oh my gosh. Clanging symbols, maybe? The covenant with God came with a duty, a responsibility, absolutely. That means that these things the people of God should be doing are not wrong. In fact, they were doing some of them. They're not sinful acts, some of the acts. They're right and they're good. But duty or responsibility alone will not strengthen or fuel your love and will not lead to a deeper loyalty or obedience to him. And since loyalty and obedience is what Mike is speaking of, we have to go there. Because eventually your love and your, do, and your obedience and your passion for God will wane and weaken if you just live out of obligation. Here's what had happened to the people in Micah's day. They were tired. Anybody here tired? I mean like right now, right now tired. And you're, you're struggling to stay awake right now. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty, yeah. If I fall asleep during my sermon, you can all leave quietly. If you fall asleep, we'll just ignore your snoring, and it'll be fine. If you're at home watching on live stream, get out of the recliner every now and then. Just stand up. If you're driving, turn the air conditioner on your face. There's all ways to stay awake. But we're tired, and the people in Micah's day were tired, but here's what they were tired. They were tired of serving. You ever get tired of serving? They were tired of church. They didn't call it church, but people get tired of church. People get tired of going to church. Tired of religion, tired of always trying to do the right thing, tired of, as the people in Micah's day, the journey to the city and the temple for the sacrifices that were over and over again, tired of the sacrifices, tired of the work of being faithful. They were tired. Why? Because being obedient to God, apart from love, became a pain to them. An overwhelming, rules-based, legalistic, do-stuff pain. And some here know exactly what I'm talking about. Because the love and the passion for the God who has redeemed us, saved us, and rescued us, and gives us a hope beyond that which we deserve, when that wanes and is forgotten, church can be a pain. And doing good can wear you out. And through this, what happened in Micah's day, the works that they had were rooted in not their obedience and loyalty and love to God, but in their selfishness, sinfulness, and spiritual, as Micah calls it, spiritual prostitution. That which was revealed because they were simply going through the motions and no longer loyal nor obedient to God alone. Not only were they not promise keepers, to use a term many of you have heard of from years past, they were covenant breakers, and that's even worse. And God would judge them accordingly because their choices matter. They made choices. They didn't simply slide into sin. They they couldn't just blame their parents because of their sinfulness. They couldn't bring their upbringing and what they missed out on. They couldn't just bring their current blame their current circumstances or their heritage or their background or their lack of opportunities or anything else that was the blame game du jour. They couldn't do that. They had, by their own will, chosen to abandon the truth for a lie. Paul speaks of that in the New Testament as well. And the duty of religion exposed that their choices were that of abandonment. Pastor Bill Curtis of Cornerstone Baptist Church in Darlington, South Carolina, in his commentary on the book of Micah, states it so clearly. He says, there's what these people did. They they chose deceit over truth. They chose coveting over contentedness. They chose stealing over earning, and they chose lying over honesty. They made all of those choices over and over and over, and God knew every one of them. And God would no longer simply seemingly let it pass. His patience was wearing thin. And in verse 7 it says, Should this be said, O house of Jacob, to the people of God himself, has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? God's words are gifts of life and hope, and God is so good. I posted this on uh, my social media page uh, last week, and I would encourage you to find it and, and, and listen to it. It's a, 
It's a podcast featuring uh, Dr. Heath Lambert and his wife Lauren from First Baptist Church of Jacksonville. I don't know how much you know about First Baptist Church of Jacksonville. Some of you are former members there. It's been a church, it's been a lighthouse in our city for many years. I say no pun intended. It's a parking garage now. But nonetheless, they've had a lot of transition, a lot of challenges, difficult challenges. And, and over the last four years, Heath and Lauren have shared, and of course we, we need to be praying for him. He's got another brain surgery coming up three in three years, amazingly. He talks about that as well. But they share the difficulties that they faced in the church. And um, really just a lot of evil and lies that were said about them. And I know there's two sides to every story, but according to the podcast, this is, and others that I know, this, this is kind of what happened, at least they're from their perspective. And, and he, he mentions one thing. There's a lot he mentions. I've had our staff listen to it, and I've had some others have said, hey, everybody ought to listen to this, not just leaders, not just pastors, everybody ought to listen to this. So I'm telling you, go listen to it. Um, he was asked by his mother-in-law, if you knew now what you, what, if you uh, knew then what you know now about, for, about going to this church and serving, would you go? And he says, no way. I'm not a masochist. It's been the hardest four years of my life. He grew up in an experience, and he'll share this in the story if you listen to it, where he was abused as a child. His mother was an alcoholic, you know, uh, mother and father divorced. Uh, she didn't love her dad. I mean, he gets through all of this. He, she tried to shoot him with a gun, uh, beat him with sticks all the time. Here's what he says. He says, I would, the last four years serving here has had me long for the good old days of childhood abuse. Religion will kill you, folks, when the passion is gone. And one thing that Lauren said in that that just really kind of resonates, her kids who are teenagers, you know, uh, <laughs> when the teenage girl shows a picture of her and all of her friends to her dad and says, Dad, these people are not allowed to be my friends anymore. I have no friends because of your job. That's a little personal. But then they asked, the kids were asking mom and dad, said, are these people even Christians? That's a legit question. You go, well, who are you to judge? Well, I don't know, a 14-year-old girl, I guess. That's who she's doing. Yeah. She's just asking, are they even Christians? I love the response that Lauren gave, though. She goes, I don't, I don't know. That's not the answer. The answer that, that, that what she went with was this. She said, I'm so glad that my children did not and are not questioning the goodness of God because of what they're seeing among those who wear his name. God is too good for people to act this way. That's what Micah said to the people of God in the Old Testament. God is too good for you to do this. You wear his name everywhere you go. You're the people of God. You're the people of Israel. You're the children of Judah. God is too good, and his words are good. But God's people were ignoring his words. Not only ignoring it, but they're rejecting it blatantly and just in case you, you have a question about this, the problem is never with God's word. For it's never wrong. Is your love of God or love for God duty or devotion? Is your walk with God simply responsibility or evidence of a loving relationship? Most every one of us who are Christians that come to know Christ, whatever the time that was, either as a child or even as an adult, I'll be very clear, very honest with you, most every one of us gets on the on-ramp of salvation because we are told if we don't, we go to hell. And I'm just going to confess, I didn't want to go to hell. I mean, I didn't want to go to hell when my little Sunday school teacher told me that if you don't know Jesus and you don't receive Jesus and you're going to go to hell, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I didn't want to go to hell, so I said, I want to know Jesus. And I've, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think many of you here would probably say, you know, that's probably why I, did. I became a Christian. I don't want to go to hell. And while that may be used by the Spirit of God to initiate the relationship that's necessary for our redemption and our, and our, and our hope, it is not the motivation for walking with him. I don't walk with God today because I don't want to go to hell. That's covered. That's sealed. That's done. I don't have to worry about that. But my walk with God today must be because I have, over time, grown into a deeper love relationship with the one who loved the, me, who did not deserve it, and still does not. Behold the Lord. He sits on that throne. He sends his son. He dies on the cross. What is fueling our walk? It must be love. For if it is not, you know what happens to Christians who do not continually be fueled by the love for God and his people? 
and even those who are not his people, is Christians tend to become legalists at that point. They're either legalists or liberals in their theology. That's t- they tend to go one way or the other. When I say liberal, I'm not talking politics, folks. I hope you get that. I'm talking liberal theology. The word of God isn't real. Jesus isn't really the son. That liberal theology that has infected so many mainline Protestant churches. Or legalism, where we don't have enough rules, let's add 20 more. If the love relationship is not there, you end up with that and empty religion. So we'll have a song of closing today, an invitation. And we don't always have a come down the aisle invitation. In most cases, people come down the aisle after the church, after the church service is over. And that is fine as well. We had, a, we had eight people join our church just two weeks ago. We had one join our church last Wednesday in a living room. Some of you are going, how is that even possible? Because you don't have to walk an aisle. You just have to have that conversation about what it means to be a believer. You have to have that transformative moment of surrender. If that hasn't happened already, it needs to happen now, where you give your life over to Christ as Lord. You fall in love with the one who loved you before you even knew him. And then you unite with this family and the obligations and the responsibilities that this entails to be part of this family at First Baptist. I'm praying that more will join. I'm praying that more will be baptized. And I'm praying that more will be saved. But today, it's really multiple invitation if you want to know christ personally please come see me either at the during the song or at the end of the song if you want to join the church please come see me during the song or at the end of the song you don't you can wait till the end of the service you don't have to come during the song but you have that option if you need someone to pray with the altar is available you can come down kneel for prayer and i hope and pray that somebody else in the church will come and sit beside you and pray with you even if they don't know you some of you are dealing with a lot of stuff right now and that's what you need Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus Christ, asking that your Holy Spirit will work in this place as only you can. Change hearts. Remove from us a heart of stone, as you said in the Old Testament. Replace it with that heart of flesh, that heart that beats for you. For those of us who are believers and have walked with you for many years, Father, we confess that sometimes, as to be really honest, for me at least, I fall into obligation and duty rather than devotion and love for you. I confess that. It impacts how I live when I just go through the motions. The business of church is important, but busyness tends to keep us away from that. So help us to be faithful in that as well. May may your church receive this invitation and respond well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's sing.